A very good afternoon to you and thanks so much for joining us on Midday Live. My name is Nanikia Minsa Brampa. Coming up in the headlines this afternoon. <music> Committees on Defense and Interior and Legal Affairs to present a report on security agreement between Ghana and the United States for debate. Also, majority leader in Parliament, Osei Chairman Sabonsu, says the right information bill, even if laid before the House today, cannot be passed. And on the foreign front, police in Spain rescued 39 women and girls smuggled from Nigeria and forced to sell sex. The detail of these plus business, sports and uh, entertainment coming up in the next hour. We begin with politics and the executives of the opposition National Democratic Congress, the NDC, uh, have stormed parliament as members prepare to debate the Ghana-USA military defense cooperation agreement. And uh, our reporter, our parliamentary correspondent Evelyn Tingma, has filed this report. We are here in Parliament House and this morning the minority members are wearing red armbands. Very unusual of them. And in the public gallery also we have the executives of the NDC. Talk about the chairman of the party, the general secretary, the deputy general secretary and some other executives. Let's talk to them and find out what exactly um, they are doing here. And so I have with me Honorable um, Johnson Esedu Ketia, who is the general secretary of the NDC. Honorable, good morning. Good morning, my sister. What exactly are you doing here in Parliament? I'm coming to uh, express my view as a Ghanaian and my objections uh, about the agreement between the government of Ghana and the U.S. Uh, to, what, to, to, for, to allow U.S. to establish a military base on our soil. But the last time the defense minister had a press conference, he did indicate that this particular whole thing was started by the NDC government. We have explained that one. It's a lie. There is nothing like that which was started by NDC government. He should come and lay the document which he claims is, is, was started by NDC in parliament so that the MPs and the general public will see the document he's talking about. It is then and only then that he, he, you can be talking about some NDC document. As we sit here, I've been a member of parliament for 12 years, and I know that if you are going to change a law or you are going to make a, a, a new law, you look at the existing situation, and then you determine what is wrong with the existing situation. All of that in the memorandum. And then you justify why you are bringing a new uh, uh, system. So the MPs will have access to all the existing documents and then your proposed document and compare before they can uh, accept your new proposal or not. But in this case, all that uh, Parliament has been fed to is a draft agreement and ministers go jumping from one radio station to the other, lying to Ghanaians that this is based on some existing agreement. Bring the existing agreement and let Ghanaians also have access to it and be able to compare whether they are talking about the same things. That those things they are talking about. They have nothing to do with things like this at all. We have, of course, we, we, we cooperate as a nation, we, we cooperate with other sovereign entities to solve problems that are common to all of us. Let me give you one example. In the, in the area where there was an Ebola outbreak, you know, and three of our sister countries in, in West Africa were affected, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea. The international community needed a staging post from where they will be intervening in the problem. So we signed agreement and allowed them access to our facilities, our airport and everything, so that for a specified period, you know, so that they can, they can bring all their vaccines, their hospital equipment and all that through Kotoka, and then from here they will be lifting them to the, those countries as and when they need them. We did that until the disease was handled. And that was the end of the matter. In the case of uh, uh, the 2015 agreement they are talking about, it has to do with the kidnapping of uh, uh, students, female students, I'm sure you are aware of it, in, 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 in uh, Nigeria. 
and the Nigerians requested the support of the Americans to be able to trace those Kibuk girls, you know. So the Americans were coming in, and they needed a staging post here. So we agreed. And so we have been speaking to the General Secretary of the National Democratic Congress, who are here to witness proceedings today. And so we will keep you updated as and when development here occur. Right, so Evelyn Tingman there joining us from Parliament quite soon. We'll be finding out if really it has been laid before Parliament, talking about that USA Ghana military agreement. But we'll stay a while longer in Parliament on the right information bill because the majority leader in Parliament, Osaiche Mensa Bonsu, says the right information bill, even if introduced to Parliament on Friday, cannot be worked on. And he says it is not a bill that can be considered under a certificate of urgency. The majority of parliamentary affairs says cabinet was to meet at 3 p.m. on Thursday over the bill before it could be sent to the assembly press for gazetting. It takes 14 days for a bill to be gazetted. The last cabinet looked at it, the subcommittee looked at it and approved of it and sent it to cabinet. The cabinet is meeting today on that. So after its approval and it's sent for gazetting, assuming it's sent for gazetting tomorrow, we have to wait for the stipulated time to mature before it comes to Parliament. The committee cannot do it tomorrow, or maybe within 48 hours or even one week. He said the RTI is not a bill that can be considered under a certificate of urgency. So when we come back mid-May, into when we shall adjourn again, which will be uh, July ending, would have dealt with it. The Swami MP said even if the bill is introduced in Parliament on Friday, it will be referred to the appropriate committee to work on whilst the House is on recess. He explained the House could not pass the bill in the last Parliament because they had to clarify certain clauses, including ensuring what information should be given to the public. Two main things. One relates to creating an office which may be an assembly point to receive all relevant information such that any citizen looking for the relevant information could go to the office and be sent. Others are saying that that would be too herculean a task to burden just one office with. So perhaps we can create an office that will serve the purpose of directions. You go there, you want some information, they will direct you to um, the relevant place to go and seek the information. And all ministries in that case would then be required to establish information units within the ministries. Meanwhile, the Parliamentary Press Corps has begun putting pressure on the legislature to pass the bill if introduced in the House. The members on Thursday wore T-shirts to that effect. We are fully aware that two main issues need to be considered when the bill is before Parliament. The issue of considering whether the country should have a central laboratory where those seeking to assess the information can go there, or whether there should be a reference center where those seeking the information can go and be directed to certain places for the required information. They believe the bill, if passed, will enhance their work as journalists. All right, so more reactions on the RTR and the Center for Democratic Development, CDD, is equally urging the Okufado led administration to pass the right information bill to deepen transparency and accountability. Executive Director of the CDD, Professor Kwesi Prempe, maintains Ghanaians can be true citizens and not spectators only when the right information bill is passed into law. We take the president at his word. Uh, um, he uh, has indicated that, in fact, his government uh, will, will, will ensure that this is passed. Of course, he is in the executive. Uh, Parliament is a, a different institution. It has its own processes and time timelines and calendars and process. So we, uh, we are not sure. We are almost certain that it's probably not going to be passed before they rise this time. Um, Friday is about, about the deadline, uh, but we expect 
we expect that in good faith uh, uh, the president's word uh, will, will, will come to fruition and that when the parliament resumes, uh, we expect that it to be on top of the agenda of, of the next session of parliament. There are those who say that, I mean, clearly the president himself knew that it was going to be difficult for the bill to be, I mean, laid and passed within the short period, but he still went ahead to say that this meeting of, of this parliament, what, what, what do you make of that? Well, the, it, 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 it might uh, suggest, it would, it would appear to suggest that the, the president probably was not fully apprised of the status of 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 the bill he may not have been fully apprised of it or and that's shocking well it's not it's not necessarily shocking uh if, if he, he may probably not have known that it's probably not made it through the gazetting process and you know it's 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 um, not shocking that he would not necessarily know the full detail in terms of where the law stands in the process i think it's in the president's own interest in furtherance of his own agenda to fight corruption that this law be passed you know there's really no other reason not to pass it and and to keep holding on to it even continues then to undermine the credibility of the political class people then begin to think uh, these people they have something to hide what's there to hide if there's nothing to hide give citizens the tools they need to find the information about how their government is being run. If, if you want us to be citizens and not spectators, how better to be citizens than to be informed? Information is a crucial, crucial ingredient. All right, so let's move away from the RTI, but we're still staying in Parliament where the minority there has accused the Ghana National Petroleum Corporation of deviating from its core mandate and must be checked. Now, according to minority spokesperson on finance at forcing the move by GMPC to spend $20 million to build a new head office in Accra and $13.4 million to renovate that same office is worrying. Parliament approved the 2018 program of activities for GNPC, but not without concerns, particularly by the minority. MP for Ejumako Enyane Siem at Forsen noted the continuous borrowing by GNPC adds up to the public debt. You see, the budget approved an amount of 998 million Ghana cities for Ghana National Petroleum Company. They have said that instead of the budget approving 998 million, they are going to spend 4.5 billion. And you know what they are spending the money on. And out of this, they are going to the capital market to borrow. What even surprises me is that this very administration criticized Cocoa Board for doing Cocoa Roads. Strangely, GMPC is going to spend 300 million Ghana cities to build agricultural roads. Atu Forsen said for GNPC to spend $10 million to build an operational office in Takradi was outrageous. I was born in Sekendi, Takradi. I don't know of a building that will cost $10 million. Operational office, $10 million in Secondary Takrade. For some strange reason, GMPC is saying they are going to spend $20 million for the purposes of building their head office in Accra. In spite of that, they have an existing head office. They are saying they are spending 13.4 million Ghana cities to renovate that office. What are they, at all are they renovating? They're also saying that they are going to spend an amount, almost $2 million, to build a transit quarters for their staff. So anytime they go to Takrade, they go and sleep there. They are going ahead to invest $24 million to now go into gold mining. Gold mine. GMPC doing gold mine. This is a mining company. But the Minister of Energy, Boachie Jaco, said the ministry scaled down an earlier projected amount of $76 million to $20 million. He also defended the move by GNPC to spend $10 million in building an office in Takrade. He said it was better to build a befitting edifice, noting the construction of the operational office would start after it has gone through tender and the contract awarded. Mr. Speaker, no particular group of people have a monopoly over expertise. It is within the province of the executive to employ and deploy the, from the pool of talent.
a total of 1,602.82 million cities was approved for the GNPC for its 2018 activities. You're watching Midday Live. Remember, we're streaming live on Facebook. It's TV3 Ghana and also on DSTV channel 279. To some more this afternoon, the Ghana Bar Association has revealed plans to make deductions from their dues to support the legal aid system. According to Vice President of the Association, lawyer Anthony Forson, the legal aid system in the country needs some form of sacrifice from all to help the poor. A report released by the American Civil Liberties Union indicates more than 3,200 people are serving prison sentences without bail for nonviolent crimes. A close examination of these cases by the union reveals just how petty some of these offenses are. Another research conducted by the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative has also revealed that most persons charged with petty offenses are the poor and vulnerable in society. The report seeks to bring to the fore the irrelevance of certain laws in the statutory books of Ghana. Speaking exclusively to TV3 News on the sidelines of a roundtable workshop on advocacy towards decriminalizing of petty offenses in the country, the vice president of the Ghana Bar Association, lawyer Anthony Forson, says there is the need for the justice system to be reformed to ensure the rule of law works in favor of all. We released some of the monies about three years ago to the legal aid scheme, but there was some um, difficulty with classifying it, whether it was uh, money which had to go to the consolidated fund or it had to uh, go through a certain account, etc., etc. But that has been resolved. So I believe that going forward, the legal aid will be having assistance from the Ghana bar dues. The Commissioner for the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice Judge, Joseph Withel, also thinks it's about time the prisons are decongested of petty offenders as prostitutes and vagabonds. If you have offenses that are technically speaking not supposed to be on the statute book, the likelihood is that a happy police officer could one day get up and put the people before court and such people could end up in prison, should it be the case. The Municipal Chief Executive of Pristia Honey Valley, Mozart O, says government has made financial commitment to a business promoter to turn palm kernel byproducts to charcoal bars. He says this is an avenue to generate revenue for the assembly and also create employment for the people. As part of government's one district, one factory policy, the Pristia Honey Valley district will establish oil palm plantations in order to partner with a Chinese company which intends using the byproduct of oil palm to produce charcoal bar. In line with this, 22,700 cities has already been given to the promoter. Although the area hosts three mining companies, the indigents are mostly into cocoa, rubber and oil palm plantations. Speaking at the inauguration of the Pristia Huni Valley District at the capital Bogoso, the chief executive officer, Muzat Ou, expressed optimism that the municipality will be industrialized as produce and byproducts from the plantation become useful. He also mentioned the likelihood of the Aposo glass factory being revamped soon. The MC believes these and other projects will increase infrastructure and soon position the municipality to become a metropolitan area. The president's representative, Minister of Tourism and Creative Arts, and member of parliament for Ivalue Ajomorodjura constituency, Catherine Afiku, in response to a proposal by traditional leaders of Fiasiman Traditional Council for government to liaise with the mining companies to site a gold museum in the area, said a comprehensive regional tourism plan is being considered. She added that her ministry is working towards making the western region a growth pole in tourism. The possibility of creating gold museums as a tourist site in the Pristia Honey Valley Municipal. Western region has so much to offer and that could be a very good tourism offering. And on our MTN video reports for this afternoon, Wisdom Anan reports from Bonguno in the Ningo Pram Pram constituency on a pole that has been erected in the middle of the road causing accidents. is in 
the middle of the road. The pole is here while the contractor started building the road. And they refused to remove the pole from the roadside. So that the vehicles that do use the road will have good access to pass by. Most drivers use their vehicles to hit the pole. While some Okada drivers also do the same. So we are appealing to the government and the stakeholders to come to our aid so that they can be able to remove their pole from the road. So that the vehicles and other motor riders will have their successful way of passing or using this particular road. Once again, I'm Anand Wisdom, reporting from Pomuno. All right, so you can follow Wisdom's example by sending your video reports via WhatsApp number at 055 We return with some business and sports after this. This is Midday Live. Thanks for staying with us to business now and monetary policy alone cannot clip lending rates appreciably except when factors like a functioning national ID system, a working credit bureau, an efficient address system, digital land registry and an interpreter interpretability system are accounted for and this is according to the vice president dr mahamud Baumia. now according to him 70 percent of houses in accra do not have titles and he describes such houses as debt capital in the ground which cannot be used to raise equity and support economic development the monetary policy committee of the bank of ghana has begun its meetings and is expected to announce the next policy rate sometime next week. Although the policy rate has been declining for the past year, there hasn't been a corresponding reduction in interest rates charged by commercial banks in the country, thereby making cost of credit expensive. According to Vice President Dr. Mahamudu Baumia, monetary policy alone cannot clip lending rates appreciably, except when factors like a functioning national ID system, a working credit bureau, an efficient address system, digital land registry, and an interoperability system are accounted for. If you have a situation where government is borrowing a lot and, and interest rates therefore are high, uh, banks will just lend to the government and do nothing else. So it was easy for the banks to do. But in a country where you cannot really uniquely identify somebody, really say this is me it's difficult to lend in a country where you cannot uniquely identify where they live like this is my address and you know that when i go there i can find you there it is very difficult to lend in a country where you don't have a functioning credit reference bureau right it is very difficult to lend. You will lend, but at higher risk premium. And, and so as we looked at these issues uh, at the central bank, we, we basically came to the conclusion that you know, for, the, for the transformation to happen in the banking system, we needed really to put in place as a country a national ID database. According to him, 70% of houses in Accra do not have titles. He described such houses as debt capital in the ground, which cannot be used to raise equity and support economic development. Now, following the takeover of the three local banks and the closure of many microfinance institutions in the last year, the business desk has been finding out whether the confidence of Ghanaians has waned in the operations of indigenous financial institutions here in the country. In the space of less than a year, Ghanaians have witnessed what can be called a major financial sector shakeup. From the takeover of UT and Capital Bank late last year by the Commercial Bank to Bank of Ghana clamping down on several microfinance institutions and more recently the Unibank takeover by the Bank of Ghana. The Bank of Ghana has assured Ghanaians not to expect any banks to be distressed enough to be taken over for the rest of this year. 
But the major question here is, have these developments affected the confidence of Ghanaians in the banking sector? The Ghanaian banking system are now losing a lot of uh, respect in terms of confidence from the, from, from the public. Where were they? Negative 24 pesos. And where were they? Where was the Bank of Ghana? It's a worry to somebody like me because it's, it's telling me our financial uh, experts, I will put it, are not doing the right diligence that to keep them going. Every institution has, has a supervising you know, rule. I mean, so Bank of Ghana, you know, supervises all the banks. So when they look, when, let's say they are up there and they look down, they see this one is going wrong, they cut it off. And then we continue with the rest. The Ghanaian banking system, I think it's fine, but just that uh, it's not helping the ordinary Ghanaian. They take so much from the people and give so little back. Why do you think people had interest in DKM and the rest of the people? Because they felt that DKM were dealing with them fairly. We're dealing with them justly. We're dealing with them equitably. We cross over to Dr. Richmond Etuahine, who is a banking consultant, and he gives us expert opinion. We need to take swift actions in some of these areas. When it comes to banking, you hear parliamentarians talking about That's where my worry is. Mm -hmm. Politicians should stay there and let those who can discuss this issue discuss it dispassionately. It is clear many Ghanaians are apprehensive about happenings in the financial sector and are hopeful the Bank of Ghana will exercise its mandate to restore hope. Nuang Falong, TV3, Accra. All right, so we have more business updates in our subsequent bulletin. That's it for business. But to some more stories this afternoon. And the Ghana Water Company says the Operation Vanguard intervention has not yielded the, des the desired result as legal mining activities across the country persist. The Managing Director, Engineer Clifford Berima, who made the observation at Mahia in the Greater Accra region to mark World Water Day, said the company spends as much money in treating water as it did before the ban on illegal and small-scale mining. The pollution of the country's water bodies was key in this year's celebration. According to the Ghana Water Company Limited, most water bodies have been polluted beyond treatment and feared Ghana may not be able to produce drinking water in the near future. It listed crude oil dumping, the discharge of untreated urban domestic waste and other industrial processes as other contributing factors. When Operation Vanguard was introduced, the turbidity levels improved and we started using five bags of aluminum sulfate from 12. But as of yesterday, we are going back to the original. We are using 10 bags of aluminum sulfate per day. What it means is that we are losing the fight against the Galamse menace. So Operation Vanguard probably is not the way to go. He explained the company continues to spend huge sums of money on chemicals to treat raw water, necessitating an increase in water tariffs. But the issue is, will Public Utility Regulatory Commission allow us to do that? If they don't allow us to do it, and our cost of operation goes very high, what it means is that we we'll defer maintenance. And once we defer maintenance, in future the system will collapse. The director of the Water Research Institute requested government to protect the Volta Lake, which is the only water body in the country which has not been polluted. Volta Lake is of good quality because there are no Galamse activities taking place in or around the Volta River system. If we should discover any mineral as a country around the Volta Lake, I can assure you that we would end up polluting the Volta Lake. This year's celebration is on a the theme, Nature for Water. Meanwhile, two major unions in the utility sector have asked government to sustain the extension on the ban on small-scale and illegal mining to protect water bodies. Leadership of both unions were addressing a news conference to mark this year's World Water Day in Accra. Sustainable Development Goal 6 mandates governments to ensure the provision of clean water and sanitation facilities. In the case of Ghana, a ban has been placed on illegal mining following the pollution of most river bodies. To mark World Water Day, 
the Public Services Workers Union, implored governments to sustain the fight against illegal mining activities. And I'm sure if we sustain it, the rains coming will clear everything and we'll get our waters very clean. And if small-scale mining will come again, we make sure they don't happen along our river bodies. Environmental experts have predicted that Ghana could suffer water shortage by year 2025. But the General Secretary of the Public Utilities Workers Union Pool, Michael Edumata Nyantechi, expects government to inject more funds to support the operations of Ghana Water Company. Workers in the public service to be alert and be on guard. If we allow all the things that are so crucial and essential to become privatized, we may find ourselves in very difficult situation. World Water Day is observed on March 22 every year to highlight the importance of fresh water and advocate its sustainable management. And Yao Fusulabi joins us with some sports news after this. We'll be right back. And to some international news this afternoon, police in Spain have rescued 39 women and girls who were smuggled over from Nigeria, kept in caves and forced to sell sex. They were coerced into leaving home with voodoo threats, then exploited as prostitutes to pay back 30,000 euro debts. According to Europol, the criminal cartel had links to the EA Brotherhood, one of the most influential fraternities in Nigeria. The gang was allegedly operating clandestinely all over the world, pumping money back into the network. Some 89 people were arrested during raids last November, including a famous but as yet unnamed DJ, accused of acting as a pimp across a number of provinces. He was caught flying back to Spain after recording a music video. Detectives at Europol described it as one of the largest operations against human trafficking in Europe. Europol said raids were carried out across 11 Spanish cities last November, but the operation could not be announced until Thursday to avoid jeopardizing investigations. President Donald Trump is replacing U.S. National Security Advisor Jen McMaster with Bush-era defense hawk and former United Nations Ambassador John Bolton. President Trump tweeted to thank McMaster, saying he had done an outstanding job and will always remain his friend. John Bolton, who has backed attacking North Korea and Iran, said his job would be to ensure that the president has the full range of options. He becomes Trump's third national security chief in 14 months. Jen McMaster is the latest high-profile departure from the White House. Coming up now is some entertainment news. And on entertainment this afternoon, musical instruments comes in various shapes and forms. Some known musical instruments include piano, organ, accordion, guitars, trumpets, saxophone, just to mention a few. But did you know the carpenter saw use for cutting woods is a musical instrument. Well, it is known as the musical saw, and Emmanuel Legendman has more on this report. The musical saw is just like the carpenter saw used for cutting woods. Just like the violin instrument is played with a bow, the musical saw is also played with a bow. I have in my hand the carpenter's saw. This is a normal saw that our carpenters are using for their woodwork. But Mr. Asante Daku says that this is a musical instrument and it's called the musical saw. So Mr. Asante Daku, can you tell us um, about this musical saw? So all I know is that uh, it originated from Germany, as I was told. A, a carpenter in his shop hanged his saw on the wall. Eventually, Accidentally, it fell down. But you could hear a certain sound that produced after the uh, fell of the saw. So he managed and picked a tune from it, and he started playing it. And that was how it originated, as I would know.
Asante Dako also noted that as of now, he has not seen lots of people playing the musical saw in Ghana. I know one Mr. Dennis from Baptist Church, Tema. He plays now. And about two people from Kumasi. That's all I know. And yourself, how long did it take you to learn? And then secondly, how long have you been playing this kind of musical instrument? I've played this uh, musical instrument for over 30 years. But uh, it took me just one week to learn because I'm already musically inclined. Our end, the glory of the Lord. Wow. Okay, so Mr. Asante Daku, would you encourage people to start uh, learning this instrument? If they wish to learn, anybody who wants to learn it, I can teach the so person here. If the person doesn't know how to play it, how long is it going to take the person to learn how to play? Well, the, if the person is musically inclined, he has a years to, hit, to, know, uh, to notice the, uh, the keys. It, it will take him just two weeks to learn. Mr. Asante Dako, who is organist and he's been playing the musical saw for some time now. Emmanuel Ajiman, TV3 News. And I would love to learn how to play that musical saw. But to a rather uh, important news just in, we understand that the right information bill has been tabled before Parliament and referred to the Constitutional and Legal Affairs Committee. My colleague Evelyn Tingma is in Parliament and she'll be joining us with uh, updates on this particular one in subsequent bulle bulletins. But that would do for Midday Live this afternoon. There's more on 3news.com, also on DSTV channel 279. My name is Danikia Mensah Bamba. Have a good afternoon and do enjoy your lunch.